did my master's and my PhD at SOAS. Um, so it's a very familiar place, although I have to say that was a very long time ago. Um, some of it was actually last century, which certainly makes it sound a long time ago. Um, so um, I'm going to stand up to do this simply because I need to um, change the slides from time to time. Um, so is that okay in terms of sound? Okay, well, um, I want to start um, this talk um, by remembering um, the 15 women who died uh, in the second week of November 2014 um, after undergoing sterilization surgery um, under appalling conditions in camps in Bilaspur district of Chhattisgarh in India. Um, according to a fact-finding report by uh, the Sama Resource Group for Women and Health, these women were all in their 20s and 30s, um, and they were all from Dalit, Adivasi, and other backward classes communities. Most of them were from landless households, and their main source of income was uh, agricultural wage labor or other forms of daily wage labor. But while their deaths um, made headlines, albeit briefly, these tragic events cannot be seen as an aberration. Rather, I argue that they're inherent within approaches to uh, what's called family planning, which can be better understood as population control policies. So I want to begin by thinking about four interlinked aspects of these sort of atrocities. Um, and of India's population policies which produce them. Uh, firstly, I want to think about coercive sterilizations as a form of embodied gendered violence perpetrated by the state and transnational actors, um, both in the sense of direct embodied violence, uh, which uh, this, these sterilizations involve, but also in terms of the way they depend on wider structural violence um, of social and economic inequality, which also itself has embodied effects. So when feminists and left activists and others referred to the sterilization deaths in Chhattisgarh in 2014 as a massacre, they were consciously evoking comparisons with the whole history of gendered violence against poor women and Dalit and Adivasi women in particular by the state and other powerful forces. Now, although um, sterilizations are a long-term feature of Indian policy, um, they're currently being extended and intensified within a framework of neoliberal economic policies and patterns of global capital accumulation. And um, what I suggest is that the 21st century resurgence of population control globally, which I'll go into in more detail, and its reframing in terms of reproductive rights cannot be fully understood except in relation to certain current processes. And these are processes of um, accumulation by dispossession to which the intensification of women's labor and its mobilization for global capital is absolutely central. So far from giving the women in the global south much needed access to safe contraception which they can control, these policies actually dehumanize them as excessively reproductive and set targets which make atrocities like those of Chhattisgarh possible. Now thirdly, at the same time, population control discourse, I'd suggest, demonstrates a particular characteristic of contemporary neoliberalism, and that's its ability to appropriate and transform critical ideas. So since the 1990s, it's been increasingly reframed in terms of feminist ideas about reproductive rights. And this discourse of rights and choices operates to make the violence of population control less visible. Finally, um, I want to suggest that this violence has been intensified in India in the current context of a symbiotic relationship between neoliberal development and the Hindu right in contemporary India. So now, um, in terms of the global context, um, as part of uh, my ongoing research on uh, race, racism, and development, which Faisi mentioned, um, I've been looking at population control 
as a racialized project of capital. Um, as you probably know, it's very much rooted in the twin ideologies of Malthusianism on the one hand and eugenics on the other. Um, now, when we think of Malthusianism, you know, we tend to think about Thomas Malthus's uh, theories of overpopulation. Um, but one can also argue that his primary legacy is broader than that. Um, it's been to provide an enduring argument for the prevention of social and economic change um, by suggesting that the poverty which is associated with capitalist development is an inevitable consequence of population increase rather than of the logic of capital accumulation. So Malthusianism has not only shaped specifically population control policies, but has also influenced a lot of key theories and practices of development which is similarly based on the assumption that the poverty stems from the behavior of the poor themselves, which then becomes a target for intervention. Um, now this, of course, um, was combined with um, eugenicist ideas um, and more broadly with ideologies of racial supremacy. Um, but it's also important to note that the Malthusianism of the 19th century was intimately linked to the imperialist project and continued to shape policy uh, in, in, uh, in colonies long after it was marginalized in Britain. Um, now, the influence of Malthusian ideas in England declined over the course of the 19th century with the beginnings of a demographic transition to lower birth rates, as well as the mass immigration of the poor as part of the colonial project. Although, of course, more broad Malthusian ideas which blamed the poor for their own poverty continued to be evoked. Um, it was in the later part of the 19th century when the cumulative effects of a number of different processes, deindustrialization, taxation, forced cultivation of cash crops, and other forms of integration <coughs> into world markets, combined, uh, as Mike Davis has written so uh, compellingly, with uh, El Nino crop failures to provide, produce a series of devastating famines across the global south, that Malthusian ideas really came into their own in shaping colonial responses to famine. So in the Indian context, um, colonial officials like Lord Lytton, who is the viceroy, during the famine of 1876 to 9, in which up to 10.3 million people are estimated to have died, uh, invoke Malthusian principles to justify um, the colonial state's refusal to take any action to prevent these deaths. Um, the finance minister, later Lord Cromer, stated, every benevolent attempt made to mitigate the effects of famine and defective sanitation serves but to enhance the evils resulting from overpopulation. Um, and Sir Richard Temple, who was appointed to ensure that India continued to produce immense revenues for Britain and its, at that time, imperial war in Afghanistan, even at the height of the famine, implemented the notorious Temple <coughs> wage in relief camps, which, combined with hard labor, could only lead to slow death by starvation. Now, um, in the first half of the 20th century, with the rise of anti-colonial struggles, you had a shift in the way uh, populations in the Global South were represented, and they came to be represented as a racialized threat. So it's quite interesting if you look at the kind of change in the language used about these people and these populations. So whereas earlier they were described in terms of apathy and indolence and fatalism, um, all tropes which are used to justify colonial inaction in the face of famine and starvation. These, so, these same populations now became uh, portrayed as ominously hyperactive, and you constantly come across these words like swarming and teeming and seething in relation to um, populations. But it was in the context of the Cold War um, and the reconfiguration of imperialism after formal independence um, and the rise of often communist-led libera national liberation movements challenging the control over and distribution of resources 
that population control really came into its own with extensive support from um, both states and uh, a very wide range of, of representatives of corporate capital. Um, and this is something which I look at in more detail in, in, in my book. Um, in 1952, uh, coming to India, um, in 1952, um, birth control advocate Margaret Sanger, who herself famously shifted from being a feminist and a socialist sympathizer to a confirmed eugenicist, uh, along with uh, Lady Dhanvanti Rama Rao, launched the International Planned Parenthood Federation in Bombay. Uh, the funding for the International Planned Parenthood Federation uh, initially came from the Hugh Moore Fund and the Rockefeller Foundation. Soon it attracted funding from DuPont Chemicals, Standard Oil and Shell, the US Sugar Corporation, General Motors, Chase Manhattan Bank, uh, Gulf Oil and many others, which have been described as a veritable who's who of America's corporate and finance capital at the time. In the same year, India became one of the first countries to initiate an official family planning program. Between 1952 and 1975, the Ford Foundation spent $35 million to finance family planning programs, and India received more than $20 million of this. Now, um, sterilization of women has been the main method used in India's population control policy since the late 1970s. Um, as many of you may know, during the emergency of 1975 to 1977 under Indira Gandhi, um, men were taken in large numbers forcibly to camps for, for vasectomies. This is interesting because it's one of the few examples where men have been targeted on a mass scale. Um, and um, it generated massive opposition. And in fact, it's seen as one of the main contributors to the historic uh, electoral defeat of the Congress party in 1977. Um, the drive for female uh, sterilization, which then became the main method used in population policies, further intensified in the context of the neoliberal reforms from the 90s onwards. Um, since 2000, approximately 4.5 million tubectomies have been taking place every year in India. Um, and data suggests, for example, that in 2005 to 6, around 37% of married women had actually undergone sterilization. Um, it's by far the most um, common form of contraception. Uh, accounted for about 75% of <coughs> all contraceptive uh, use. In um, Bilaspur district, where the sterilization camp deaths, which I mentioned at the beginning, took place, um, the figure of women who had undergone sterilization was as high as 47.2%. <coughs> now, um, a major feature of this recent period has been the privatization of family <coughs> planning programs. Um, so surgeries are outsourced to private clinics and hospitals, and doctors, private health centers, and NGOs are paid incentives for every woman that they can sterilize. Um, the doctor who um, single-handedly conducted 83 surgeries in less than three hours at one of the Chhattisar camps actually received an award previously from the state health ministry um, for performing a record 50,000 surgeries during his career. Um, and this scale of doing things is ongoing. For example, there was another case uh, in Varanasi at the end of January 2015 where uh, 73 women were sterilized in four hours. So you can imagine the uh, degree of care and um, precautions which are being taken and the kind of uh, risks involved when uh, operations are being carried out on that scale in relatively small spaces. Um, further, as Human Rights Watch reported in 2012, in much of the country, authorities aggressively pursue targets, especially for female sterilization. Um, and health workers are routinely threatened with uh, salary cuts or with losing their jobs if they don't produce women to be sterilized. Now, after the 1994 uh, Cairo Conference on Population, 
Uh, the Indian government claimed that it was abandoning targets, which was identified as being one of the main drivers of abuses like the Chhattisgarh massacre. But in fact, these have simply been replaced with the euphemistically named expected levels of achievement um, at state level. Now, the Indian government's program implementation plan shows a target for Chhattisgarh state of 150,000 tubectomies for the current financial year um, and an increase in targets in subsequent years. Um, now, on a national level, you know, there are some officially recorded statistics and officially recorded deaths caused by sterilization between 2003 and 2012 translate into 12 deaths a month on average, and actual figures are almost certainly much higher than that. These women died after being lied to about the operation and what it involved, threatened with the loss of ration cards or access to government welfare schemes, or bribed with small amounts of cash or food, sometimes just you know a, a few eggs and a handful of lentils. Um, or as with the Chhattisgarh 2014 case, actually being forcibly taken into camps. Now, when we look at these escalation of population control interventions in India, we also have to look at the contemporary resurgence of population control ideas and practices globally. Um, how they're increasingly corporate-led, and of course this is something we can see in many different areas of development. Um, and how this has impacted on and been incorporated into the Indian state's approach. Um, now, um, about three and a half years ago, just before the London Olympics, um, on World Population Day in 2012, uh, David Cameron hosted a very different kind of uh, event in London, which was the London Family Planning <coughs> Summit. Um, and it was hosted by the British government along with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which has been very instrumental in, in this whole field and in influencing Britain to take the lead on population issues. Along with USAID, UNFPA, and other international organizations, they announced a $2.6 billion, uh, $2 billion family planning strategy, which is called FP2020. Um, to get 120 million more girls and women in the poorest countries to use voluntary family planning by 2020. Now this um, relies very heavily on the mass promotion of long-acting hormonal, injectable, and implantable contraceptives, such as Dipoprovera, Implanon, and uh, Jadel, which is also known as Norplant 2. Um, all of which have been campaigned against extensively by reproductive health activists in South Asia and elsewhere because of the debilitating um, side effects they have. And this is something which I'll come back to later. Now on one level, um, these new population initiatives, as in earlier versions dating right back to Malthus, are geared towards shifting responsibility for poverty away from capital and onto the poor themselves. So population growth in the global south is today variously held responsible for climate change, for food crisis generated by the takeover of land by corporates and foreign governments, for migration from the south to the north, and is also being linked now to terrorism uh, in a revival of the CIA's uh, youth bulge theory, which they had during the Cold War. Um, which suggests that populations with uh, a large young component are uh, more likely to pose a security threat. Now, I think this concept of stratified reproduction um, is um, particularly useful here, both at a global level and, as we'll see later, at a national level. Stratified reproduction has been uh, defined by Rainer Rapp as the hierarchical organization of reproductive health, fecundity, birth experiences, and child rearing that supports and rewards the maternity of some women while despising or outlawing, or outlawing the mother work of others. <coughs> so applying this notion of stratified reproduction globally, we find that um, population discourse increasingly focuses on differences in the compositions of population um, rather than only um, their growth. 
So as uh, Suzanne Schultz and Daniel Bendix note, economic development is thought to be directly linked to the age composition of a population and to favorable age dependency ratios, meaning a higher proportion of people of employable age than of older people and children and adolescents. Controlling fertility, they suggest, above all in African countries and supporting pro-natalist measures in the North, thus do not appear as neo-colonial policies of racist difference, but as rational answers to differing age constellations. Now, this approach also insists that if only people, poor people in the global South can be persuaded or compelled not to reproduce, then the World Bank and IMF-inspired neoliberal policies um, in which health provision, along with education, sanitation, and other essential public services have been decimated since the 1980s, can remain in place. So, for example, we have um, the uh, former British Development Secretary, Andrew Mitchell, um, describing population policies as excellent value for money. And he cited Tanzania, which he claims would need 131,000 fewer teachers by 2035 if fertility <coughs> declines, saving millions of pounds in the long run. So now, both sterilization campaigns and the promotion of long-acting hormonal contraceptives are taking place in the context of a wider withdrawal and neglect of health provision, which is central to neoliberalism. So Schultz and Bendig note in their study of German development aid that it is shaped by an imbalance between population and basic health care programs. For example, in 2012, um, the uh, German Development Department spent 169 million euros on population programs, which is 22 million euros more than it spent on basic health care. Within population programs, there's also an increase in money spent on standalone family planning programs in contrast to those dedicated to broader reproductive health. Um, now, in particular, long-acting injectable and implantable hormonal contraceptives, such as Implanon, produced by Merck, and Cyana Press, which is the new version of Depo-Provera, currently being promoted by collaboration between the Gates Foundation, USID, uh, DFID, UNFPA, and um, Pfizer, um, and uh, Jadel or Norplant, produced by Bayer, are specifically being promoted, uh, we're being told, because they can be used in contexts where basic health provision is absent. Um, they can be um, administered by minimally trained health <coughs> workers, who, as we know, are in fact often unpaid women workers. Um, and I think it's worth looking in more detail at uh, you know, the British government DFID's recent initiative with Merck which has aimed to promote the long-lasting implant, Implanon, to, uh, as they put it, 14.5 million of the poorest women by 2015. Now, if we look at what Implanon is, it was actually discontinued in the UK in 2010 because trained medical personnel were finding it too difficult to insert and there were fears about <coughs> its safety. As well as debilitating side effects, the implant was reported as disappearing inside women's bodies. So what Merck has done is introduced a new version called Nexplanon, which is detectable by X-ray. Um, but they've been allowed to continue to sell their existing stocks of Implanon. And it's this discontinued drug, in fact, which is being promoted in <coughs> DFID and UNFPA programs in the poorest countries despite these countries' huge deficit of trained health personnel. For example, in Ethiopia, one of the target countries, mass insertions of Implanon are part of what's called task shifting, where hastily trained health extension workers are being, being made to take on roles um, of doctors and nurses. Um, now, in India, the increased pressure of meeting FP 2020 commitments on family planning has been accompanied by the further undermining of already inadequate health provision since the Narendra Modi government came to power um, in 2014. Um, ahead of the publication on 12th December of a major study by Indian health experts, um, which highlighted this recently, 
Um, the editor of The Lancet, Richard Horton, commented, the problem in India is that health has completely dropped off the political agenda. Before Modi came in, health was an issue that wasn't as high on the agenda as it should have been, but it was definitely on the agenda. Since Modi has come in, health has completely vanished, and this is a desperate predicament. Um, but I would argue, however, that there's another reason that population control has emerged as a central aspect of neoliberalism. Um, and this is because controlling women's fertility um, has become inextricably linked to a strategy of the extension and intensification of women's labor for global capital. Now, um, if you look at processes which have been taking place globally since the 1990s, on the one hand, you have uh, the global contraction of the share which direct <coughs> producers are getting in profits, um, part of what David Harvey calls accumulation by dispossession. And this is partly being achieved through um, intensifying the unwaged and waged labor of women, um, through which increasingly poor households attempt to survive. So there's this on the one hand. And on the other hand, uh, the further incorporation of women into global labor markets and value chains is seen as an important ongoing source for the expanded reproduction of capital. Um, so as I've argued elsewhere, it's this which underpins ideas like um, the World Bank's um, slogan, gender equality is smart economics, um, the Nike Foundation's girl effect, um, all of these uh, you know, very catchy slogans which we see being promoted by the World Bank, DFID, Co and corporates and so on. At the core of these ideas, I'd suggest, are um, gendered and also racialized ideas of poor women and girls in the global south as having this infinitely elastic ca capacity for labor as well as for altruism, which makes them potentially ideal uh, neoliberal subjects. And I'll come back to this later. Um, as in Puerto Rico in the 1950s, uh, which, uh, where coercive mass sterilization drives were pioneered as one of the earliest experiments in increasing profits by outsourcing manufacturing to low-paid women workers in the Global South in what was called at the time Operation Bootstrap. Um, similar to today, a reduction in women's fertility is being promoted within the smart economics framework. Um, primarily as it's regarded as facilitating women's entry into labor markets and enhancing their productivity for global capital. And we can see this quite uh, explicitly explained in a whole series of uh, documents coming out of the World Bank and so on. Um, thus, it's the drive to intensify and incorporate the labor of women in poor households in the global south, um, rather than uh, concern for rights and choices, which underpins the now ubiquitous slogan of investing in women within pol population discourse. Um, so this is a context in which we have population control being reframed in the language of reproductive rights and choices. Um, population control and smart economics policies are now linked through a neoliberal discourse of potential and possibility in which adolescent girls are to be helped to become hyper-industrious neoliberal subjects via education and access to contraception. But when we look at the actual practices of population control, which rather than giving women in the global south much needed access to safe contraception which they can control, uh, more usually involves coercive sterilizations and the testing and dumping by pharmaceutical corporations of hormonal contraceptives, we can understand that the underlying connection is not one of possibility, but of certain workers and their bodies being constructed in terms of racialized and gendered disposability um, in the sense which uh, Melissa Wright has coined the term. Now, the Indian state's population policies actually illustrate these connections very clearly. Um, the day after the 2012 World Population Summit, which I talked about in, in London, a Human Rights Watch report warned that the commitments made by the Indian government at the summit would lead to further abuses. 
And this was confirmed by a letter, which was dated October 10, 2014, um, from the um, National Rural Health Mission under the aegis of the Indian Union Ministry for Health and Family Welfare. Now, this letter states that an increase in sterilizations is essential to meet the Family Planning 2020 commitment made by India at the summit, especially for 11 high focus states. And it rules out the importance of other possible methods of contraception. The letter ordered an increase in the payment given to all those involved in carrying out sterilizations in these states. Meanwhile, um, it emerged that aid from Britain's DFID was, was, had helped to fund forcible sterilizations in the Indian states of Madhya Pradesh and Bihar, in which a number of women had died in 2012 uh, under similar conditions to those in Chhattisgarh. But to fully understand the complex of forces which lead to such deaths, we also have to look at the specificities of the Indian neoliberal state at this moment. We need to understand the neoliberal state, controlled as it is at present by the Hindu right, in terms of both the withdrawal from social provision as well as the intensification of state intervention on behalf of globalized capital, and in the context of resistance, the escalation of repression and state violence. So this then leads us to highlight three related processes which shape the targeting of the fertility of women who are marked by their gender, class, caste, and community. So first of all, as I've talked about, there's the strategy of extending and intensifying women's labor. Now, in the Indian context, this is epitomized by Modi's current campaign, which is called Make in India. And it's based on the promotion of India as a location for low cost, efficient, and largely female labor. Now, a recent study of the experiences of mainly Dalit young women migrant workers in Tamil Nadu's textile industry by the Center for Research on Multinational Corporations and the India Committee of the Netherlands showed how gender and caste-based restrictions on mobility and interaction um, and other coercive and abusive practices are central to the operations of the factories, which supply European and US clothing brands. As Kavita Krishnan points out, while practices such as the strict segregation of workers the bans on going out, the bans on having a cell phone, are all being enforced in the name of culture and in the name of providing reassurance to parents of the young women workers. They're extremely effective for capital as well. Uh, she says, by preventing workers from interacting with other male workers or activists from outside um, and discouraging socialization even among women workers on the factory floor, the women workers are very effectively prevented from even visualizing the possibility of unionizing. This suggests that rather than challenging gender norms, the expansion of this form of employment actually builds on and reinforces patriarchal gender values. It also gives an indication, I think, of the symbiotic relationship between the Hindu right with its violent so-called moral policing of gender norms on the one hand and the neoliberal economic project on the other which I suggest are not only compatible, but actually interdependent in contemporary India. Now, um, women's labor is also being mobilized through uh, the expansion and the deepening financialization of microfinance and self-help groups. Um, I mentioned earlier how uh, the discourse of gender equality is smart economics reinforces an understanding of some groups of women as having this infinite capacity for labor. Um, and I came across an example a couple of years ago, which I think illustrates this very well. Um, it was uh, a report which was uh, commissioned by the government of uh, Orisha um, to look at the conditions experienced by um, mainly Dalit, uh, landless agricultural labor women. And basically, um, what this report found was that these women um, were, when you looked at the work they were doing in the fields, the wage labor, and the domestic labor they were doing at home, they were generally working about 16 hours a day. Um, and in the peak season, when there was more wage labor available, it was actually longer than that. Um, so the report acknowledged this. But then when it came to making uh, recommendations, 
The first recommendation was that these women should be provided with income generating activities in their leisure time. Right, and the report actually bemoaned the fact that these women were using their leisure time unproductively. Um, they were apparently watching television, playing cards, gossiping, and even sleeping. So, you know, I think that gives a sense of what underpins uh, some of these ideologies about women's labor. Now, a third way in which women's labor is being mobilized is through the recruitment of rural women as unpaid volunteers who uh, receive a kind of very uh, uncertain honorarium rather than a wage in a number of schemes for social provision. So um, you have the ASHA workers, accredited social health activists, um, you have crash workers, and you have uh, school midday meal workers who are all uh, term not as state employees but as volunteers. Uh, in fact, the ASHA workers are among those who are expected to recruit women for sterilization as part of their tasks. Um, currently, I've been doing some work around the uh, struggles of midday meal workers in Bihar who are organizing to demand the rights of state employees. Um, but what has really struck me is that these women are extremely clear that the violence which they face in their day-to-day -day work at the intersection of gender, caste, and class is really central to how their exploitation operates. Um, now, equally important as the extension of women's labor um, in the Indian context is the process of dispossession and displacement of populations through corporate takeover of land and destruction of livelihoods. And population control initiatives in India can also be understood in these terms. So um, um, if we look, for example, at the state of Chhattisgarh, which is a mineral-rich state and which is ruled by the uh, BJP, also the party of Narendra Modi, which is in power at the center, um, where the sterilization camp deaths took place in November 2014, we can see a very clear illustration of this. Not only is it one of India's poorest states with abysmal health care provision, but in the last decade and a half, the region has been overrun with transnational mining corporations, security forces to clear the way for them, and international NGOs. Now, these uh, corporations are taking over fertile agricultural land and uprooting whole villages, displacing thousands of Adivasi or indigenous people. Um, state paramilitaries and armed vigilante groups, among them the recently relaunched uh, Salwa Judum, set up with initial funding from steel companies Tata and SR, have played a very key role in this displacement. And women and girls have been targeted for horrific sexual violence at the hands of the police and paramilitaries. The most widely known case is that of activist Soni Sori, who was targeted for exposing police atrocities, but there are many others. It's within this framework where poor people and their livelihoods are simply an obstacle to be swept aside in the name of development, um, which we can read as a corporate land grab, essentially that we need to place the intensified targeting of women from these poorest groups for <coughs> coercive sterilization. Now, um, thirdly, I want to uh, look uh, at the question of embodied and discursive violence um, being um, uh, promoted by uh, the forces of uh, what I call Hindu supremacism associated with um, Modi and the, um, the RSS, which is the kind of core group um, around which all the other Hindu right-wing organizations are organized, um, and its relationship to population control. Now, so far, we've looked at the impact of the Hindu rights ascendance to power at the center and the formation of the Modi government in <coughs> 2014, primarily in terms of kind of things being intensified, the intensification of the violence of population control, the appropriation of resources, and the extension of women's labor. Um, so the marked deepening and widening of processes already underway. 
But when considering population control, we also need to think about the dominance of Hindu supremacist ideology and how this affects these processes and facilitates and legitimizes them. And I think it's useful in this context to return here to the notion of stratified reproduction, um, of some people's reproduction being valued and others being uh, demonized. Now, the trope of higher population growth rates among India's minority Muslim community in relation to the Hindu majority is a central element in a whole arsenal of myths which are repeatedly mobilized by Hindu right-wing groups in order to orchestrate uh, communal or interreligious violence, um, which particularly targets women's bodies and those of their children. Um, now, Public discourse has been permeated with this notion about Muslim population growth recently with a whole series of statements. Um, for example, on August 26 last year, an MP of the ruling BJP uh, asked the Prime Minister to implement a population control law specifically for Muslims. Um, in October, the RSS chief Mohan Bhagwat made a statement that India needed to address population imbalances between communities. And earlier, we had the BJP MP Sakshi Maharaj's statement that Hindu women should have at least four children to redress this supposed imbalance. So this very much echoes, of course, eugenicist ideas. You know, as Margaret Sanger famously stated in 1919, more children from the fit and less from the unfit, that is the chief issue of birth control. Um, and as Tanika Sarkar has written so memorably, um, women and children are particularly targeted during communal violence in ways which explicitly focus on this question of reproduction and of preventing it. Um, so the idea of, of uh, killing children and killing women who will otherwise produce children in the future um, and subjecting them to horrific forms of, of mutilation targeting their reproductive organs. Um, and this is something we had seen, of course, in Gujarat in 2002, in the genocide against the Muslim minority. Um, but it was also seen in many different contexts, like, for example, the uh, massacres of, uh, of Dalits and other um, uh, agricultural laborers in uh, Bihar by upper caste, um, by the Ranveer Sena in the late 90s. You had the same sort of thing of, uh, you know, killing women who, were, who would otherwise become the mothers of, of Naxalites and so on. Um, and the other aspect, which is, is certainly not new in any way, but has been intensified and institutionalized in new ways, is the dehumanization of Dalits in particular. Um, so now we're seeing that getting legitimization at the highest levels of government. Uh, for example, when two young children, three-year-old Vaibhav and nine-month-old Divya, were burnt to death in BJP-ruled Haryana when their home was set on fire by upper caste men as the family slept inside, you had um, a minister in the, the Modi government, VK Singh, absolving the government of responsibility and likening the murder to someone throwing stones at a dog. Um, so I'd suggest that there's a very close relationship between this kind of dehumanization and um, the, the possibility of, of uh, escalating population control atrocities of the kind we're seeing. I'd suggest that um, these discourses are not in contradiction with, but actually complement and reinforce the neoliberal approach to population control and its eugenicist and neo-Malthusian roots, whereas ultimately those women who are constituted as not belonging to the nation in a variety of ways who are targeted, while those who belong are constructed as having an obligation to reproduce the nation. So Hindu women having four children and so on. So just uh, then to uh, conclude, um, in the context we've discussed, I think it's very evident how you know, talking about reproductive rights and choices, as population policies increasingly do, serves to obscure the acute violence such policies entail and to invisibilize the structural inequalities of power and resources which makes this violence possible. <coughs>
Given this, many feminist and sexual and reproductive rights activists in India and elsewhere have instead adopted a demand for reproductive justice, um, which, as you may know, was originally developed by, um, by black feminist activists in the US um, and continues to be used in a variety of contexts. Now, whereas the reproductive rights approach claims to grant choices to individuals within a neoliberal framework, which remains unquestioned, the demand for reproductive justice makes visible much broader structural forces, economic, political, and social, which deny women control over their bodies and over wider processes of reproduction. Um, but having said this, I think we need to be aware of how this notion, too, of reproductive justice is being appropriated and transformed. For example, uh, it's now being used extensively by the Ford Foundation to focus exclusively on what they call cultural practices, for example, early marriage. Um, to really think about the possibility of reproductive justice, we need to engage not only with gender relations of power in households and communities, although these are extremely important, but also with the complex of local, national, and global forces, which, as, we, as we've been suggesting, combine with them to render certain bodies disposable. This also lo implies locating struggles for reproductive justice in the context of other forms of ongoing resistance to neoliberal dispossession. And in turn, it's extremely important that the demands for reproductive justice are incorporated as a central element in resistance to communal violence of the Hindu right, uh, corporate land grab, the destruction of livelihoods and the environment, uh, resistance to occupation and militarization, and to struggles of women <coughs> workers which are taking place in multiple contexts in India at present. So I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Uh, no. um, so and now we'll hear from um, Diana. Diana Kuhl is a professor um, of uh, political and social theory at the School of Politics um, and Sociology at Birkbeck. Um, her research focuses on uh, modern and contemporary political uh, uh, and social theory, primarily on um, critical theory, um, existential phenomenology, um, post-structuralism, and feminism. She's a theorist. Um, and she's uh, published, also published widely. Her 1993 book was called Women in Political Theory from Ancient Misogyny to Contemporary Feminism, and more recently with um, Samantha Frost, New Materialisms, Ontology, Agency, um, and Politics. So she's going to um, uh, just kind of frame some of the issues um, uh, <laughs> Uh, about which Kalpana um, has raised, and then we will open it to the floor. So, Diana, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to comment on such an interesting paper. Um, you may have thought from my introduction that I'm not a very appropriate person to respond to this, but <laughs> in fact, I've been working on a project on the population question for the last few years, funded by a Leverhulme um, grant. Um, in which I've been looking at the broader theoretical issues that um, underpin some of the more, more specific um, debates that you raise. In, and I think India is probably the most fascinating case study um, of somewhere where um, population control policies went horribly, horribly wrong and where there's been a very lively debate um, about the kind of issues of uh, reducing fertility and population growth and their relationship to development on the one hand and on the other um, the egregious practices which have abused women's um, human rights. I think overall the structure of your, your um, paper that really interested me was the way you take on a huge challenge which is to show the interconnections between official neo-Malthusian policies between neoliberal economics and between the and with the Hindu right, and it's really those connections that I wanted to make a few comments on and ask you about because they're clearly extremely complicated, historically variable, and I think maybe at times more complex, but also I think 
a significant issue here is how necessary those relationships are and how contingent they are. So whether we could envisage them being played out rather differently. And I think what you bring out incredibly well in the Indian case and what makes this triangulation particularly interesting there is the way all this is happening in a very particular context of, of specifically caste and gender hierarchies. Um, as we know, there's a huge amount of gender violence against women in India, and, that's be and that plus caste violence has been always very much entangled with um, India's neo-Malthusian family planning programs. So I think there are three particular relationships here that are interesting to perhaps disentangle. First of all is the relationship between population control policies as such and the contingencies of the Indian situation. <coughs> Obviously population control is a very emotive term and I think it's noticeable that more recent Indian literature and particularly, for example, the response to the 2011 census, the language is much more shifted towards population stabilization. And I wonder, in that context, can we say, as you seem to, that all population stabilization policies are necessarily motivated by racism and eugenics? Or are there some particularities in the Indian context which make that link much stronger? Because it, these are often spoken of as synonyms. But for example, some environmentalists would argue that it's precisely affluent populations which have high per capita incomes, greenhouse gas emissions, and so on, who are the greatest threat to the environment. So it's possible there are other discourses, it seems to me, um, that may, may make this a particularly Indian story. Um, secondly, the relationship between the state and its official family planning policies and Indian society, um, because it seems as if the kind of hierarchies you refer to really infiltrate so many of uh, uh, so much of the policy repertoire in India. Um, do you think that population is a particular vehicle which has been used for advancing an uncivil society? Are the connections there unbreakable? Um, again, are, is the source of violence the, the state's population policies as such, or should we be looking much more towards the kind of everyday violence that pervades the state. And thirdly, neoliberal antinatalism. And it seems to me that really interesting the connections you're making between the Hindu right and um, a resurgence of neoliberal, or well, particularly neoliberal, um, neo Malthusianism. And it reminds me really of the 1980s when preceding this in the West, there'd been a real sense among feminists that family planning was something that they wanted to campaign for, that was emancipatory, in which small, a small family norm allowed women to go out and work, and that this was a really important element of their freedom. Um, so on the one hand, um, I think that the connection between the new policies and the rise of the Hindu right reminds me of the rise of neoliberalism in the states originally where um, all the limits to growth arguments were thrown out in the name of a social conservatism which both argued that population growth was not dangerous to economies on the contrary um, population growth and economic growth became closely entangled thereafter but also with social, socially conservative views on abortion. And I would just note here that you said a lot about the violence of compulsory sterilization and so on. And you're obviously right in the Indian context, this has a very long history. But what are also about um, the kind of violence involved in women who are obliged to take pregnancies to term, who don't have access to decent family planning, 
services who find with privatization that they can't access safe contraception. Is it here the particular form that reproductive technologies have taken in India that, that is the problem? Or is it that you, you seem sometimes to suggest that family planning policies are always motivated by some kind of sinister, either corporate or racist interests? It would seem to me that it's really important to, to keep in mind all those surveys that show um, women in the global south, some 200 million, have an unmet need for contraception, that perhaps funding isn't always used for um, egregious purposes of control, and that women's access to safe abortion, to reproductive health, um, to not having repeated pregnancies, which um, we know hurt, hurt maternal health, are these not also aspects that we that perhaps just make the situation rather more complex? Um, having said that, also, I've got another couple of minutes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Um, the issue of incentives, disincentives, and targets, I think, is a really fascinating one, because clearly in India, they have been used for coercive means and I thought it was really interesting that at the Cairo conference it was actually the Indian delegation which put this onto the agenda and had it written into the plan of action. But the paragraphs dealing with that actually the, after Cairo are really ambiguous because on the one hand they fully recognise their use for coercive purposes in India and yet at the same time they note that this is the kind of bread and butter of liberal, liberal governance that incentives, targets, absolutely core to neoliberal governmentality. Um, you know, the NHS may not have targets for sterilizing people, but it has targets for almost everything else. Um, incentives and disincentives in the form of market mechanisms absolutely pervade the whole, um, the whole field of liberal governance. So I think it's an interesting question that why they became such sinister instruments in India and whether we want to throw out, you know, whether the language of targets and incentives is always coercive and if so, uh, where that leaves liberal governance. So I think there are lots of interesting biopolitical measures here which are in, which are in play and which perhaps are not particular to India but are also common to many countries but with very different um, degrees of, of coercion and and voluntarism. Um, I, if there's anything else you can raise it in, yeah. the, in the wider discussion. Yeah. Okay. I would just I would just say that I th I think I think the advantages or disadvantages of um, fertility growth or decline for neoliberalism are really complex, and they depend a great deal on the state of the labour market and on human capital, and so it's a really difficult field for neoliberals to negotiate because actually they'd quite like to turn fertility on and off as a tap in tandem with economic cycles, but, you know, the, the two are obviously out of sync. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, well, thank you very much, Diana, for those very interesting um, responses and, and points. Um, I'm not going to respond to all of them because I do want to have, you know, time for an open discussion with the audience, but I would like to respond to a few of them. Um, um, one thing is I'd like to start off by saying that uh, one point where I think we clearly agreed is that there is um, a tremendous need for, um, uh, for, particularly in the global south, for access to safe contraception which women can control. And I think, you know, there's no doubt about that. I think that though that um, when, um, when that uh, access is shaped by the kind of forces which are shaping it at the moment, and I don't think this is something specific to India, um, then I think that's not going to happen. And I think that's what's extremely problematic. Um, and I think, you know, yes, I've talked a lot about India and its specific history with sterilizations, but I think also there's a tremendous degree of concern about the new um, long-acting contraceptives, which are new only in the sense of new forms of delivery, which are supposed to be easier, and are, are in fact a recycling of um, contraceptives around which women in the global north have actively campaigned about their dangers and so on. So I think that is something where I would, 
I, I would slightly disagree with your sort of, in a way, your picture of sort of Indian ex exceptionalism. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, you've got um, uh, sexual and reproductive health activists in sub-Saharan Africa and in Latin America equally raising these kind of questions. Um, for example, you know, when the Gates Foundation is promoting Sayana Press, as, which is Depo Provera, as the answer, and they're saying that they are currently uh, running tests in Africa to see if women can um, inject themselves, that is basically being put forward in the context of a continuing kind of evisceration of health services. So what that means is that you know women don't have access to uh, any kind of support, which is a very different context from the main, the, the, the broadest situation of access to um, contraceptives in, in this country, for example, where you assume the NHS is there, if something goes wrong, if you have an implant which is causing unbearable side effects, then you can have it removed, in theory, anyway. Um, and that's, so it's a very different context, and I think we have to continue, I think, um, what activists are saying is that they have to continue to press for women in the Global South to have the same rights to those sorts of uh, levels of safety and care. Um, coming on to this whole question you raised, which I think is very important about um, um, you know, the approach of feminists in the West in the 1980s and how important that was, the whole question of freedom and so on. And I think absolutely you know, that's certainly the case. Um, having said that, I think you know, in a way the 1980s was probably the time when um, the whole question of reproductive rights became a very divisive one, as I'm sure you're aware, for the women's movement. Um, because of the very different experiences, not only of, of women in the global south, but also of, um, of black and ethnic minority women in the global north, where, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the right to choose defined narrowly in terms of abortion rights was not the only or perhaps even the main question in terms of reproductive rights because of uh, women being targeted for sterilization and, and, and this is still going on in fact for um, you know being specifically targeted for um, injectables for example and implantables, um, women in prison, uh, women with disabilities, uh, migrant women and ethnic minority women being particularly targeted and this is something you know um, it's happening it's happening now as a student of mine has, has is doing some work at the moment about programs in Hackney which uh, you know of this type so I think you know the, that is something to bear in mind I also think um, the whole question of, of you know the rise of neoliberalism in the 80s in tandem with social conservatism is very important but I think that we also have to look at kind of the way neoliberalism has has shape shifted in terms of its gender discourse and the way in which now you have a situation where a kind of um, you know a, a lip service to gender equality has become uh, ubiquitous, really, in, in, within neoliberalism, and, and now you certainly do have uh, a great deal of focus on um, on reproductive rights in the way that I've outlined, and I don't think that is specific to, to India, certainly. Um, having said that, you know, um, abortion is still obviously a massive issue uh, across, um, you know, the U.S., Latin America, a lot of Africa, and so on. Um, and, you know, if you look at, for example, the Gates Foundation, a lot of the time you have um, uh, implantable and injectable long-term contraceptives being promoted precisely in the context of sort of preventing pregnancies and therefore abortion. So it's not, you know, it, it's, it's very much linked to um, continuing um, uh, denial of access to abortion in a lot of places. Having said that, um, we do need to look at different places and, and the specificity of different places, as you said. And certainly in India, um, that's not the case. In fact, one could argue that part of, uh, you know, for many middle class women, part of being a good woman has come to be defined as going in for sex selective abortions in order to produce sons for the family. So there are differences about, about abortion. But, um, you know, still a very key issue. Um, in terms of population control being necessarily racist or whether, I don't think we can argue that that's a specifically Indian story. Um, um, in fact, what I talked about in the context of, of the kind of importance of race was much more about the global story, really, and much more about um, 
the way in which there is still a, a kind of sense of um, particular populations being the one whose growth is problematic. And I think, you know, you're right. There are, there are environmental activists focusing on populations in the global north who have a much bigger carbon footprint and so on. And in fact, you know, it's arguable that in the, the few countries in the world which have increasing population growth rates, which are in sub-Saharan Africa, um, they have some of the smallest carbon footprints in the world. So, you know, there's a lot of contradictions around the fact that it's those parts of the world which are being targeted, not by the Indian state, clearly, but by global institutions, um, you know, including governments in the north, including um, the Gates Foundation, which has become very central, including, of course, the pharmaceutical corporations who are very much part of the story. Um, so I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. I mean, there's lots of other things I could, you know, respond to, but hopefully things will come up in the discussion. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> okay, great. So we'll start with Ale. Thank you so much, for um, great presentation and great discussion. For I guess I have two questions. And I agree with you that I don't think it's very useful to stress Indian exceptionalism because you do have, uh, you know, comparators uh, in terms of other countries one should distinguish between uh, reproductive rights campaigns that uh, led to a number of achievements as opposed to top-down state-led policies which have been much more racialized in nature uh, historically. However, I wonder uh, if we can make it all a case about neoliberal exceptionalism because effectively the first of these cases you see under Indira Gandhi. So in a sense, my question to you would be why would you appeal to neoliberalism in terms of what's happening now, if instead there's a very long journey in terms of civilization policy framework. So what do you think is special to neoliberalism in relation to the implementation of these policies? That would be the, the first question. The second question is in relation to what you define as this uh, intensification of women's labor, um, which I'll agree with you, it's something that we observe at global levels, but instead India is an outlier if you look at estimates, mm. at least for wage labor. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. like for instance, there is a lot of statistical work done by Indrani Matunda, Nita, et cetera, that looks at how only by looking at unwage contributions mm -hmm. you're mm -hmm. actually able to see mm -hmm. what's going on in India because it doesn't really manifest uh, um, in uh, paid labor. And in mm -hmm. fact, the example you mentioned about Karnataka is one of the very few cases where you do observe immunization in India mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if also, it just should be stressed with reference to the Indian case, the way mm. in which, or the mm. channel mm. in which this process of intensification mm. is taking place, as opposed to other places mm. where mm. it could be more progressive, mm. at least in mm. terms of mm. opening up skills for mm. systems. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think... Why don't we take a few, okay. maybe yeah. four yeah. or five or something. If you want to um, speak, yeah, just indicate. Um, uh, hi, thank you for high school group into Sweet Dog. Uh, my, well. yeah. my question is sort of related to the first question that uh, she also raised, which is to uh, sort of look at the periodizations that you are looking at. Uh, for instance, liberalization and also uh, Hindu revivalism and the Hindu right wing coming in. Um, rather than looking at the political dispensations at different stages, uh, I would want you to sort of link it up or sort of have your thoughts on the relationship between state itself as an institution and how women bodies are perceived, or female bodies are perceived as child bearers and rarers. And in that context, probably we would see a more of continuation in terms of how the Indian state has dealt with women and the connection with population growth and control. Um, of course, which gets sort of intensified with these phases coming in. So just a thought on that. Thanks. Thank you. Speak up. 
question, then you can answer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, first, thanks for the lecture. It's really interesting. But I have one point which I can't really wrap my head around. Like, Modi's Make in India campaign gives the idea that there's free, there's proper female labor available. While on the same scale, while literally on the opposite end of the scale, you have communal violence targeted against women specifically. Mm -hmm. So I don't see how those two kind of fit into his whole paradigm of her developing or developing. <coughs> Into the paradigm of what, sorry? Into this um, idea of a developing nation. Okay, okay. Okay. Um, Can we? Yeah. yeah. So, um, I think if you don't mind, I'll kind of go backwards. So I'll just start with yours very briefly, which is that, I mean, I think... <laughs> I think a lot of people have sort of suggested that you know there's this huge contradiction between um, you know the ex between the sort of ideas of the Hindu right as well as the scale of violence that we've seen perpetrated by organisations associated with the BJP and the RSS and so on, and you know Modi's economic policies that there's a contradiction there. Um, and in a way, what I'm what I'm <coughs> suggesting is that in fact we need to think of it much more in terms of actually they're having quite a symbiotic relationship. Um, in the sense of um, the way in which um, these forms of violence actually, you know, don't, they don't necessarily disrupt and they may in fact further um, the interests of uh, Indian and global corporate capital, um, you know, which is why, for example, you've had so much support for uh, the Gujarat, so-called Gujarat model, um, from corporates, even though you know who 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 didn't really have a problem with the 2002 genocide taking place in Gujarat under Modi, um, you know, so you have this kind of um, and in fact, you know, pr uh, post the 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 violence and so on, you had you know a lot of like uh, real estate being taken over, all kinds of things happening as a result of that displacement which it caused, and so you know there are a lot of arguments to suggest that in fact there's a kind of there isn't a contradiction there. Um, and in fact, you know, the idea that there's two strands within the Hindu right and so on. Um, in fact, now and um, now that the government is in power, we can see how closely they're working together, in fact. So I think, you know, one needs to be careful about assuming that there's a contradiction there. Um, in terms of um, in terms of uh, the Beti Bachao campaign, I think you know you've already said some of the, some of the key points about it. Um, I think it's um, I mean this was about the girl child, right, and um, and about um, uh, against um, uh, um, female feticide and um, you know which is a huge issue in India and in favor of girls' education. So it was focusing on the daughter. So clearly, you know, it was framed within this quite sort of um, <coughs> patriarchal kind of notion of save our daughters and so on. And as you said, had this undercurrent about, um, you know, the problems of uh, gender imbalance in terms of marriage. Um, I think in a way it's quite a good example of the kind of gender um, discourse we have in the sort of within the development model which is now being promoted. Um, because you do have these two things going together. On the one hand, the kind of um, idea of, of women and girls as sort of having a potential for the economy and so on, um, but within a framework which is highly socially conservative. And, and you have this situation then where women are, are um, uh, you know, where, where you have this uh, mobilization to an extent, and it's very much a potential mobilization of women's labor. Um, making use of the the um, of gender norms which are assumed to sort of keep women very docile which are assumed to um, uh, you know not really um, involve a kind of challenging of of uh, uh, patriarchally prescribed ways of behavior for women and I think Beti Bachao kind of fits in with that that combination quite well actually so we can look at it that way um, and and yes I mean there is the whole question of um, I mean, pro-natalism in terms of the Save Our Daughters campaign, I mean, that's in the context of, of this gender imbalance, which has come out of years of, of uh, son preference. So I don't know if I would really describe it as pro-natalism in that sense. Although, obviously, as I mentioned, there are, you know, H Hindu right-wing ideologues talking about, you know, the need for Hindus to have more children and so on, which is a slightly different issue, I think. Um, and coming on to, to um, 
um, the point about um, women's, um, you know, obviously, yes, uh, India is a country which has a very low participation rate of women officially. And what we're not, we haven't seen to date the kind of thing, for example, which we've seen even in Bangladesh, um, where you've got, you know, um, women, you know, entering factories and so on in large numbers. And that has had certain impacts, um, you know, different different stories from different people, but clearly it has had an impact to a certain extent on gender relations. Um, so, so I think it is, it is much more about then um, this being a kind of potential which is being seen as something which could happen. It's a kind of seen as an untapped resource. But I think, I mean, precisely because of this low participation in particularly formal wage labor, I think you're absolutely right that in order to look at the way um, women's uh, work has been intensified. We have to look both at the kind of uh, extension of kind of uh, reproductive labor, which is accompanied um, neoliberal reforms, as well as uh, the whole question of sort of informal work and so on. And that's really where you can see that process going on of the intensification of women's labor. But in terms of incorporating them into the formal workforce, it's very much um, you know, this idea of untapped potential, which again fits in with things like the Beti Bachao uh, campaign. Um, and I mean, yes, you know, the, the whole question of the relationship between sterilization and the advent of neoliberalism, particularly from the 90s, I mean, yes, clearly, you know, uh, you know, we know about, you know, what happened during the emergency and sterilization has continued since then, as, as I said, sterilization of women is the major form of, of family planning and so on. Um, I think the point is really that um, it got a tremendous boost, um, you know, after the, um, the um, um, after this came to the fore globally once again, which, is, which has really been relatively recently. Um, so, you know, as I said, you know, India kind of signing up to particular commitments around FP 2020 and so on has had this kind of direct effect that, you know, it's, it's a counterbalance to the kind of outrage and the kind of pressure from civil society after some of the, um, you know, the, the sterilization deaths which got a great deal of publicity because there is this pressure. And I think that's, that's really the point that, um, you know, s sterilization was there all along, but it's had a tremendous boost, and it's now been kind of incorporated into this mo this wider um, this wider kind of international drive. Uh, so that's why I kind of associated, which, and I think that international drive can very clearly be understood in the context of neoliberalism, and it, it does very f much fit in with that. Um, and in terms of your point about the um, the state as 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 an institution, I mean, I think the state as an institution is very important to look at, and there are tremendous continuities, and I think we can see, you know, I mean, we can see it manifested in a lot of different levels in the terms of, as you said, the way women's bodies are seen and perceived and understood and treated. And I think, um, you know, I mean, um, you know, if you look at, for example, women's experience of childbirth in government hospitals, you know, this, it's, it's, it's pretty horrific, and, it, you know, it reflects that again. Um, you know, the sense of disposability, really, this complete dehumanization which women are, are, are experiencing. And I think that is very, very important to look at the continuity. I think the point is really that, you know, I think it is important to look at what difference it makes um, at a particular time, the kind of forces which are in power. So I think you need to look at both. I think you need to look at the continuities, but I also think you need to look at the difference it makes when um, when these things are happening and they are kind of described, or you know, at the highest levels as being mistakes or aberrations. There's a difference when you then when you have statements being made at the highest levels, which really say, "Well, this is our policy," which is essentially the message which is given by the kind of statements which we've had from ministers and so on. Um, so I think that's something to think about. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Um, you mentioned with Justin Barrier that the Ford Foundation has recently got a big amount of money to spend on early marriage. And then right. doing lots of things with feminist organizations. Yeah. Were you suggesting that there's a potential issue there that's going to rise in terms of what you spend on? Yeah, I mean, I think the thing is, you know, um, again, you know, it, these, are, these are very important feminist issues and they're not, you know, questions to to neglect, but I think the point is that like 
when reproductive justice increasingly becomes something which is talked about only in this particular context and in the context of cultural practices, um, then a lot of things get excluded, a lot of things get made invisible. Um, you know, like the kind of, you know, um, um, you know the, the other things which are involved in reproductive justice. So, for example, the experience of a woman, um, you know, going to a sterilization camp of the type I've described would not then come within a reproductive justice framework if reproductive justice is increasingly understood purely in terms of um, the thing, the, the, the pressure she, she experiences within the household or, or within her community, you know, because then you wouldn't look, for example, at the question of, of targets by the state. You wouldn't look at um, the relationship between, you know, a landless woman worker and a health functionary, for example, and the, the imbalance of power there. You wouldn't look at, um, you know, the impact on that woman of, uh, you know, losing access to land which she previously had. Um, and why that might mean that, you know, um, she felt it was necessary to accept a, a, an offer of sort of a small amount of lentils and be sterilized in return. So, so a lot of questions then get excluded. And I think this has happened already in terms of reproductive rights, which become like, okay, you know, which of, which of the uh, contraceptives are, are being promoted? And, and that's, that's your choice. Um, and I think it's in danger of happening a little bit with reproductive justice as well. So I was just kind of highlighting that this is a kind of ongoing process where new ideas get developed to kind of, um, in a way, address broader questions than earlier ones. And then they tend to get kind of taken on board in a much more limited way, which then transforms their meaning. So that's really what I was talking about. So we have time for one, possibly two more questions. We have one here. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Right, right, right. Right, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Also, kind of ties into this idea of dysfunctionality, but have very different parents. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to answer that directly, or do you want to take this one first? Yeah, okay, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, in terms of the whole question of surrogacy, yes. I mean, thank you for bringing that up because I think it's very relevant. And in fact, you know, as you probably know, it's it's a huge issue in India, where you know, in fact, India is positioning itself in the surrogacy market in a very big way. Um, and I think yes. I mean, I think it does bring up a lot of kind of quite similar issues, as you said, um, in a different way. I mean, I think um, you know the idea of of um, What's, I think what's interesting is the idea that, you know, if you look at the way companies who are involved in surrogacy are, are marketing themselves, it's very much about um, that, I mean, not only obviously the nature of, of sur commercial surrogacy is that, you know, the, the woman will not have any rights over the, 
the baby, but but the fact that the wom they market themselves on the basis that the woman is completely removed from her own context. So she does, you know, and I think that is very interesting in terms of, you know, the attempt in a way to, um, you know, to kind of uh, disconnect the woman's body from 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 her from her life in a way, and also from. Uh, the associations of, you know, poverty and, you know, there's also a lot of NRIs who, who go for this and so there are questions of caste and so on and, you know, and all of that. So I think it, it's very, it's it's very interesting. I mean, I think, you know, that certainly is relevant. Um, and I think it, it also shows that, you know, it isn't ultimately about a kind of, you know, an antenatal or pronatal approach, but really about the kind of, um, about about as you said this notion of gender disposability i mean gender in a very intersectional sense um in terms of um uh your point about yeah i mean i i'm not you know in the business of saying like something is is always bad or or that and i think you know i do appreciate that also you know ngos are in a situation very often of kind of needing to take funding from various sources and so on but i think there is there is a problem about um you know, very often the kind of limitations which funders place on what can be raised and what can't, you know. And and the fact that very often there are, um, you know, there are particular buzzwords, there are particular um, themes which are considered to be the ones that NGOs should be focusing on and others which simply aren't, which then, you know, fall off the agenda. So I think there is, I mean, I think the whole question of NGOization of, of the women's movement is a huge issue, not only in, in India and South Asia, but also elsewhere. You know, it's been written about extensively in Latin America and so on. So I think, you know, it's it's a question to to go on being aware of. I think in a way what's what's on a more positive note, I think that, and this is not the case everywhere, but I think certainly in India we can see quite a vibrant uh, women's movement, which is not NGO-led, you know, and there are a lot of contradictions there, and there are a lot of kind of conflicts and so on, but it is there, and I think that's something to, to bear in mind, um, because very often, you know, there is a sense that NGOs would like, international NGOs, you know, would like to really equate themselves with civil society and, and, and you know, the, the NGOs which they fund represent social movements and they don't. So we have to keep kind of visibilizing those movements which are actually not, uh, in fact, <laughs> NGOs. Um, sorry, there was, um, sorry, can you just remind me of the um, other question which yes, is, that was yeah, one okay, so, back. yeah, and, and that was, yeah, I mean, um, the main ones um, at the moment, there are a number of uh, um, um, corporates which are very involved in, in this whole process. I mean, there's um, Merck, which is the, the um, manufacturer of Implanon. Um, there's Pfizer, which is now taking over the manufacture of Depo-Provera, and they're promoting this thing called Cyana Press. Um, I mean, that's very interesting because that's basically saying that women should um, ultimately be able to inject it themselves. Um, but in a way, like the whole argument about long acting hormonal contraceptives has been that um, women need something which isn't necessarily going to be known about by their partners and families. And now they're saying, well, you know, women should do this in their own homes and they shouldn't have to go to clinics or have any contact with any health workers. So there's a lot of contradictions. And I feel that it fits in very much with a kind of, uh, as I said, a kind of cutting away of all kind of connection with with state provided health services. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's um, there's Bayer, which is a big German company, very much very closely linked up to the German aid and development and so on. So yeah, that's a few of them. So join me in thanking uh, Kalpana for a wonderful uh, thought provoking talk. And I'd just like to draw your attention to this leaflet. This is uh, the rest of the seminar series, um, and you can find them over there if you don't have one. Um, next week, we'll be meeting here, Tuesday, 5 p.m., uh, for Mariana Mazzacato, and she's going to be speaking on economic policy from market fixing to market making and creating. Um, so do come along for that. And um, if you're around, uh, join us uh, in the SCR uh, on the first floor for uh, reception. Thank you.
Yeah, and it was really that link which with the neoliberal policies, I think, is really an interesting one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, y